morning, friends, and welcome to this very special Amazing Facts Summit entitled Holding the Line. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world on the various television networks, also live streaming on the internet. Thank you for being a part of this very special event. We'd also like to welcome those who are here in person, our regular church members, as well as those who are visiting with us today. We've been planning and looking forward to this weekend for a long time, so we are glad you are here. So uh, this series is not only this morning, but as you know, it's going to continue this afternoon. So at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have another afternoon of presentations. So please make sure that you're here by 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's 2 o'clock Pacific time for those who are watching. We also want to tell you about our free offer that we have and a magazine, one of Amazing Facts' is more popular sharing magazines. It's called America in Prophecy. For those of you who are watching, if you'd like to receive a free digital download of the magazine, just simply text the word magazine to the number 40544 and you'll be able to receive a digital download. Now, if you're outside of North America, just simply go to the website afsummit.org and you'll be able to download the magazine there as well. Well, our presenter this morning is going to be Pastor Doug Batchelor, and his title is The Foundation of Creation. But before we have that, you can see we have our Granite Bay Church Choir as well as our orchestra. They'll be bringing us a special musical number.
at Granite Bay. Very thankful for our leaders and our musicians and very thankful for all of you who are here bright and early at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. I want to welcome again those who are joining us on AFTV, 3ABN, Good News Television, It Is Written TV, uh, YouTube, and uh, we're just so thankful you can be part of this special event, Holding the Line, where we are talking about being faithful to biblical truth, the Christian teachings, why we're surrounded by a culture of compromise. In a moment, I'll share with you what my segment of this presentation is going to be, talking about the cornerstone of creation. Uh, but before we do, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, dear Lord, on this holy Sabbath day, as we come together as your people to better understand the truth of your word and that you are our creator, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take possession of every mind and heart, our ears, my mouth, and so that the truth in your word might be glorified. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now this subject today is especially precious to me because it's talking about the issue of creation. Well, I thought this might happen. I'm pressing the button and nothing's moving. Maybe we'll get a technician who'll take a look at that. And uh, I've got backup because this stuff happens. <laughs> you know, if you're going to build a wall, it's so important that you get the cornerstone in the right place. Because if your cornerstone is off, you know, it, it actually determines the wall, it's uh, three dimensions of its length, its breadth, and its height. And if there's anything out of sync on that cornerstone, it'll affect all the different walls and the different directions that they're going. And uh, that's gonna throw everything out of kilter. The cornerstone for the Christian faith is creation. And that's why it's so important that we understand that. You can read in Psalms 11:13. Still nothing. I don't know if a technician can, someone can check and see if they can get this going. I'm looking kind of hopelessly, helplessly. <laughs> I can't do it from here. Psalms 11, verse 3. Oh, there we go. Working now. You got it. It's working. Let's see. Let's make sure. There it is. Praise the Lord. In Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What's going to happen if you lose the foundations? And in Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens. They are the work of your hands. Now, when it comes to the subject of evolution and creation, your worldview affects everything else in your life. What your perspective is on three very important points. Where did you come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? Now, I'm coming to you from somebody that grew up believing there was no God. I was raised pretty much atheist or agnostic, and I don't even think I understood what the difference was. I just didn't, God was not part of my life, didn't believe there was a God. I went to about 14 different schools growing up, and virtually all of them taught me, and I had no reason to disagree, that we had evolved from lower forms of life. The problem with that is, when you have that worldview, life has no purpose. And it just didn't make any sense. You realize that uh, the worldview, for those who believe in creation, I'm sorry, evolution, is that everything everywhere came from nothing for no reason. Well, that's not very scientific. But that's what much of the world believes. It is so important. And not having a right view on the subject of creation affects most of the major issues that we're battling with in our culture today. For example, the sanctity of human life. If we don't believe that we're made in the image of God, then it's going to affect our views. And they, people won't have problems with assisted suicide or abortion if human life is not sacred. But if we believe that human life is made in the image of God, it changes everything. Amen? The violence in our culture, and lately there's been so much gun violence, and I, 
I just nearly explode watching some of the pundits on television talking about, well, we need more counseling. And if we just had better controls and more laws, and I'm thinking, what about teaching people that life is sacred? And the Ten Commandments, do not kill. You know, when I was first going to school, public school in California, they had the Ten Commandments on the wall. We sort of inherently knew you don't kill. It is like one of the greatest sins. That's not being taught. And if young people are being entertained by murder, what you sow, you're going to reap. It affects it. Racism in the culture. That's right. If everything evolved, and you know Darwin, and in fairness, Darwin was against slavery, but he was a racist. You can work at Marine World and want to set the killer whales free, but you don't think the killer whales are as smart as you are. You see what I'm saying? And so while he had sympathy for slaves, he clearly believed that they were inferior, that different races were inferior. A lot of people don't know. They don't put it on the books anymore because it's, it's uh, not politically correct. The original tile, title of Darwin's book, Origin of Species, here's the whole title. It's on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races for the struggle of life. That's why Darwin was the hero of people like Adolf Hitler who believed that some races were inferior and should be eradicated. So when people say, what do we do about racism in our culture? Well, don't teach evolution. Stalin, Darwin was a hero. So many of these despots that have killed millions. It also affects the value of life. Teenage suicide from 1950 to 2020 tripled. It is the second leading cause of death. Well, I used to think about suicide all the time because if you're unhappy and when you die, you basically go to sleep and turn into fertilizer and you don't know anything anymore. If your experience of existence is miserable, then get it over with. Can you understand the thinking? But if you realize that there's a God and there's an eternity and self-murder, if that's the last act of your life, your eternal destiny can be in question, you think twice about it. And if you have a God you can turn to with your problems, it makes all the difference in the world. The sanctity of marriage. It's a cornerstone. Creation is a cornerstone. In the beginning, Jesus even quotes Genesis, Mark 10, verse 6, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. By the way, Jesus only gave us two options. And marriage is one man, one biologically born man, for one woman. Now you have to clarify that. But our culture is very confused, and you can't separate some of that confusion from the teachings of evolution. And even holy time, regular time to worship God, the Sabbath is there, and it's foundational. And every Sabbath, we remember that God is the creator. Neglecting that, people forget. Also, he made the Sabbath holy, telling us that he can make us holy. So understanding the truth about what the Bible says is foundational. It is a cornerstone. So I've got uh, nine reasons I'm going to share with you why I believe, not just the Bible, I think we all know that the Bible supports um, creation, but I'm going to be sharing with you why I be, believe that not just the Bible, but geology, biology, archaeology, anthropology, cosmology, and paleontology support creation. These are all questions I had to answer because I grew up believing the other. I used to have pity on people that God believed that God created. I felt sorry for them. But then as time went by and I read the Bible, I first read the Bible thinking it was a fairy tale. The Holy Spirit worked on my heart and I began to ask a lot of questions. I'm not coming to you as a scientist. I'm coming to you as just a regular person. I think I have at least average intelligence and I'm going to give you the reasons in my study that I came to the conclusion that the biblical answer is a more reasonable answer. I believe in intelligent design. Now, just right there in the very um, beginning, you can see that um, there's design in nature. We're surrounded by it everywhere. It is so clear that there's incre incredible complexity in nature. 
something, everything had to come from somewhere. And as I mentioned, you could either believe that everything everywhere came from nowhere for no reason, with no cause. That's what evolution teaches. They don't know what the cause was. They said, Big Bang, what caused that? What was the causal incident? And they say, well, you believe in God. You don't know where he came from. I said, that's right. The Bible says that he is from everlasting to everlasting. I don't understand that. The Bible says that his ways are high above the earth, or the stars are high above the earth. His ways are above our ways. The Bible says God is past finding out. And when you look up at the sky at night, you think about the infinite cosmos. I accept that there's a God who made all those things. I believe it makes more sense to believe there's an intelligent God that made a world with intelligence and inner working systems. We're surrounded by it. Evolutionists believe in something called spontaneous generation. Now, you know what you've been hearing in the news a lot lately about artificial intelligence. How many of you have been hearing lately about artificial? You use it every time you use your phone. People have accused me of having artificial intelligence. <laughs> but, you know, when you use your GPS, and they've got now self-driving cars, now there's computer programs that will paint a picture. There are computer programs that will write a song. They have programs that will write a thesis. They now have actors that are being replaced because they couldn't make certain scenes, and they're able to recreate their voice and their body artificially with 3D animation. It's frightening. I've heard stories in the news just recently of parents get phone calls Ostensibly, their child is saying, I've been kidnapped, and they're crying. Please help me. They're torturing me. And these parents say, I know my child. Well, what happened is these kidnappers, these crooks, they captured that young person's voice off Facebook, and using artificial intelligence, they can make it say anything, and it sounds just like their child. And they've been extorting money that way. So here's my question. Is artificial intelligence really artificial intelligence? How did these programs get their intelligence? From intelligent programmers. Isn't that right? So artificial intelligence is really a misnomer. And if you and I don't believe for a minute that computers develop their own artificial intelligence, then where do we think we got ours? Programming. Made in the image of God. One of the things that really convinces me is the complexity of life. Now, you need to understand, back when Darwin, he, you know, he took his journey in 1835 on the Beagle, and he was looking at the similarities in species and how some species seem to go through a transition, and then you see that uh, they looked at a cell through a microscope, and to them, with their very primitive microscopes, a cell of like looked like a small, round, gelatinous blob, and they wondered, could that happen by accident? Well, conceivably, maybe it just happened. But they didn't understand the complexity of a cell of life. I found one quote online. This is by Dr. Stephen Thomas Bloom. He's written three books on biology and evolution. A single human skin cell is far more complex than the International Space Shuttle or a nuclear submarine. One cell. Even more astounding is the fact that the billions of biochemical molecules inside the cells, billions of them, act like incredibly intelligent beings with eyes, swim fins, and a brain. They know just where to go, they know what to do, and when to do it. And they're doing their thing at an incredible speed. Molecules, such as the mRNA, find their way into and out of incredibly tiny holes in the nuclear membrane and the cell membrane. And then they find and nestle themselves into the other target molecules. The systems that synthesize proteins is unbelievably complex, yet 2,000 protein molecules are synthesized every second in every cell of your body 24-7. That's all going on in one cell. If you can enlarge a cell to the side of a, size of a beach ball and open it up, you would watch, you would see a constant and endless blur of activity and intelligence in a cell. Uh, one biologist said that one human cell of life is more complex than New York City at rush hour. One cell. So, is it intelligent to believe that millions of years ago, there was an ooze 
there was water and carbon and, and uh, some basic elements floating around in this primeval world and lightning struck and a cell happened. And that cell also knew how to reproduce itself. To me, I don't have a section on it. Sex is one of the strongest arguments against evolution. If the original cells, when they decided to start a family, they just split in two, then what would ever necessitate two opposite genders to say we've got to get along to procreate? That is so inefficient. The way you would do it is a man would say, oh, I'm ready to start a family, and he just split, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that, I mean, why to change that? That's a great system. They can't figure out where along the way something happened where genders had to chase each other down and go through these different dances and things to try to entice the other one to procreate. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the complexity of life. There's another reason I don't believe, and this would be reason number two. It's the law of biogenesis, meaning that all life on the planet comes from existing life. All life on the planet comes from pre-existing life. Whether it's a seed or a cell, there's no example that we can see in the observable universe where life coming from non-life. Evolution teaches life comes from non-life. And if they believe it could happen through natural mechanisms in a warm pool billions of years ago, then why is it with all of our laboratories and sophistication and engineering of genetics, we can't make it happen one time, let alone billions of times? And then that cell that happened by accident somehow knew how to replicate itself and to move around through its environment and to stay healthy, it, it just it doesn't make sense. At least it's not making sense to me. Someone wrote, the chance of this happening by itself is greater than 10 to the 160th power it is a number that you could not write down in your lifetime. The odds have been happening. So the way that some evolutionists are dealing with this fact, the complexity of life, is they say, well, what probably happened is some intelligent creature, an alien, UFO, from another world came and seeded this planet with life. Have you heard that one before? It's, yeah, it's the uh, directed panspermia method. That, well, it was aliens brought it to the world. And now what they've done is very clever. They stick to evolution, but they say, the problem of how life began, we've just moved it outside of our world where you can't argue against it. How are we going to argue about how life started on another planet that we can't even find? Well, it's just as illogical, but that's one of the uh, reasons. And then you look at, in our world, the incredible symbiotic relationships between creatures, where different creatures could not survive and evolve without another one. You know, trees, certain trees and flowers, they must have bees, and bees must have the flowers, and where along the way did they enter into a covenant to evolve together. The starting point of how that would happen. I love this picture. Where do we get our concept of beauty? You know, there's some flowers that their stems only accommodate a particular hummingbird. And a hummingbird has a beak that will only fit certain flowers in a certain environment, and it spends its life guarding this particular flower and pollinating it. And ants. There are acacia trees that depend on the ants and the ants on the acacia trees. And there's aphids. There are ants that are shepherds. There are ants that bake bread in the sun and then bring it down below. They're all ants. There are ants that collect honey and then some of the ants hang from the ceiling of their den and supply honey for the other, they call them honey pot ants. They're all ants, but they're so incredibly different in the way they supply their food. The symbiotic relationships that we see all through the world are simply astounding. Don't you agree? And then there's the other issue. It's the history of history. Now what I mean by that is as we look around in the world, we can see that they say that mankind has existed on the planet for, you know, 10 million years. We didn't really get to where they qualify as man until about a million years ago. But you know, they have man basically just as a, an animal, a primate. And then suddenly, about 6,000 years ago, we went from dragging our knuckles to building pyramids. 
suddenly appear, understanding geometry and geology and architecture and the calendars and writing and just boom, man suddenly appears. I've got a picture, you of course know the pyramids. I've been inside the Great Pyramids and the precision and the way those stones are cut, phenomenal. I was in an island in Micronesia called Panape and they've got this whole temple complex. They call it the Venice of the Pacific and these huge basalt stones, some weighing like 50 tons, were moved 15 miles and they built this whole Lincoln Log Temple and you ask the local natives who did it and they say, we don't know it was here when we got here. But they've got the, these buildings and incredibly, uh, look at the walls that have been built by some of the Inca Indians, the masonry, you cannot fit a razor blade between the stones and how they even cut the stones with such precision and the math that would be required to do that and make it all fit and it's still standing today. Another reason when I talk about the history of history, look at the population of the world. Now this chart is just showing the population of the world from 1974 when there were four billion I remember in 1965 when there were three billion. And look at how the population has grown in that short span to eight billion in 2046, they're expecting, 2000, 2046 I should say, they're expecting to be nine billion people on the planet. Obviously it can't last like this forever. But if you extrapolate the population of man backwards, it just doesn't go 10,000 years. It doesn't go a million or 10 million years. It goes back about 4,000 years. And you, there's no way they can get around that. And even the sediments, they find everything from the moon. They expected when they landed the lunar lander, there'd be like three feet of dust. It's only a couple inches deep. So if it'd been there for millions of years, how come there's not more dust? How come there's not deeper sediment in the oceans? There's a lot of facts that are being avoided as inconvenient truths regarding uh, evolution. The oldest written records that we have are about 4,300 years old. The oldest trees we've got, we've got like the bristlecone pine trees. I'll get to that in just a moment. Then you've got the DNA migration. You know, they've, they've done a DNA genome where they're tracking people from around the world and they pretty well mapped out how the different people groups came to the different places in the world and they trace everything back either to Africa or Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, of course, is what the Bible says. You know, it doesn't take 10,000 years for people to migrate that far. Look at how fast they're migrating around the world today. And you don't even need modern transportation. In three years, Lewis and Clark went from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean and back with 40 men, a woman, and a dog. And so the idea that it took thousands of years for these people to migrate around the world, I showed you the population growth, it didn't take that long. You know, they um, came out with a study a few years ago, uh, and they say that a man, this is uh, from the New Scientist, October uh, 8, 2014, a man who died in 315 BC in Southern Africa is the closest relative yet known to all humanity with a common female ancestor. They've now traced the DNA using the mitochondrial DNA to one mother. They say everybody in the world is related to one mother. Now you've got the mother on the left, which is your biblical option, or you've got the National Geographic mother on the right. They're both looking at fruit. And so you're welcome to take which one you want. But I thought it was very interesting that they all agree everybody came from one mother. Isn't that something? Doesn't the Bible teach that? You know, in the Bible, it traces the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam. Where along the way did it go from fact to fiction? Because nobody has any reason to doubt the first 20 generations. You look in Luke 3, verse 37. The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Cainan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. That to me is fascinating. That's one reason the Bible is so precious. It traces, we don't doubt the history of the Bible in so many other respects. They get it right when it comes to the major nations of the world from Egypt and Assyria and Syria and Babylon and Medo-Persia and Rome and Greece. The Bible's very accurate. 
But when it can trace the genealogy all the way back, even giving the ages that they lived, I think you can believe the Bible. Then you have, and of course, it says in Acts 17, he has made of one blood, Acts 17, 26, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. We are all related friends. And he's determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. He determined the boundaries. The law of entropy. Now, the law of entropy is based on the second law of thermodynamics that basically says that um, a system left to itself tends from order to disorder. It tends towards chaos. And unless there is outside intelligence and work being introduced, very simply, if you've got a beautiful, well-manicured garden, flowers, rows, everything's nice and neat, and you die and you neglect it, which is what would happen if you died. And what's gonna, that garden going to look like? Nobody's taking care of the garden for a year. Is it going to look well manicured or is it going to just go to weeds and get overgrown and fall apart and be taken over by, by bugs? It tends to chaos. If you're walking down the road and you find out in the wilderness three or four rocks stacked one on top of the other, what does that tell you? Somebody was here because rocks normally, they just tend, they fall down, they tend to chaos. Someone introduced some energy and in, in order. In the universe, we see incredible evidence of order, symmetry, design, timing, beauty, which means there is an outside force that is introducing those things. So, because of the law, the second law of thermodynamics that all scientists claim to believe, I don't believe in it. Don't believe in evolution. I'm very excited about the James Webb Telescope that's up there in space now. You know what they thought? The Hubble did its best to take these ultra deep field photographs. They found what they thought was a dark spot in the sky. They said, let's focus the Hubble on that dark spot, open the aperture, and we'll see what we find. And after, I don't know, 10 days of focus with the aperture on one spot, they found it was filled with galaxies. They said, oh, we were hoping that we might find the end of the forest of the stars, where they thought we could find the edge of the universe. If we could find the edge, we could calculate back and say when the Big Bang happened. So now they got the James Webb, which is like 100 times more powerful. And they focused it already on a dark patch of the sky, hoping to find nothing, I think. You know what they found? Universe is full. And finally, several astronomers have conceded it could be that the universe is infinite. Before the James Webb, they said there are more stars in the universe than there are sands of, grains of sand on the beaches of the world. What do you think they think now that they've looked through this more powerful telescope? God is from everlasting to everlasting. He made the heavens and the earth. He made it all. And then there's what I would call a flood of evidence. And this is one of the things that got my attention. When I was reading the Bible and I began to wonder about whether the Bible was true or whether what I would, had been taught in school was true, I saw evidence of a flood everywhere. Even all I had to do is step outside of the cave and I looked at the canyon walls and the water washed walls high up. And I lived in New Mexico where at 8,000 feet in the middle of the United States, there were fossils of seashells everywhere. You look at the massive coal fields around the world and the only way you get that coal is because a tremendous amount of organic life, plants and peat and algae, was rapidly covered by sediment and then compressed. This is how you also get the oil and you get the coal, more from the peat. Do you know, in order to produce the coal reserves we have in the world today, if we took all the vegetation in the world today and tried to convert it to coal, it would only produce one-sixth of the coal that we have around the world. That means that prior to the flood, it was an incredibly lush planet. That's why they find fossils of ferns and tropical plants way up in Siberia or down in Antarctica. It's because the whole environment of the world was different once. This is what the fossil record shows. This is what the Bible says. Before the flood, it did not rain, but there was some envelope of water that polarized the environment, and the whole world was beautiful. It was a paradise. And after the cataclysm of the flood, 
This is a fossil that you find in the Himalayas, 14,000 feet up in the mountains in the middle of the continent. They got seashells. The, the whole environment went through a radical change back at that time. There is a flood of evidence for creation, friends. The oil, I don't know, any of you remember an oil company called Sinclair Oil? Had a picture of a dinosaur. Anyone remember that? They may still have a few out there somewhere. And they understood that not just dinosaurs, but dinosaurs and the organic material that was compressed in this cataclysm is what caused all the oil that you and I use to get to church today. Every time you come to church, you need to thank the antediluvians for getting you there. Then there's something that you would call, oh yeah, and then the dinosaurs. You know why they've got um, just armies of dinosaurs and prehistoric animals that are buried and fossilized. Now, I live up in the country. If a bear dies in the woods, and I know of a few that did die, but we won't go into that. And you go back and you look after a year at where that bear died, its carcass is not in one place. Its bones are torn apart, and they're scattered, and they're carried around. And they find armies of fossilized dinosaurs and these prehistoric animals that were killed. They were caught unexpectedly. And as you look around the world, you see the evidence here was this cataclysmic flood. Well, the evidence is so overwhelming that the evolutionists said, OK, OK, you're right, there was a big flood. Um, an asteroid hit the world, and it caused a global tsunami. Somehow, certain creatures survived. Alligators survived for some reason. But the bigger dinosaurs got wiped out, or certain species. The fossil record tells us that there was a cataclysm. Now, I want to stop here and just say that we do see evidence in society for what you would call microevolution. Microevolution is horizontal evolution. You will see changes between humans and different animals through either breeding or environment. Uh, a few years ago, National Geographic put out a magazine, and it was from wolf to wolf. And it said, all the dogs in the world today, I guess they did DNA samples on the dogs. They say, all the dogs in the world today can be traced back to two original wolf-like dogs. I said, amen. That's what the Bible says. Look at the diversity of dogs today. But you realize they're all dogs. And it's a frightening thought, but yes, a Great Dane and a Chihuahua can make babies. They are dogs. They're of the same kind. And um, there's great diversity, and this is because of selective breeding. But, you know, sometimes it's not because humans have been involved, but as they go off in different pairs, different traits become more dominant. Something else they've discovered about DNA, your DNA can be affected by your environment where it makes changes that help you. These are both hairs. You've got an Arctic hair and a desert hair. They are both rabbits. One of them clearly went through changes that make it survive better in its environment. The desert hare has got bigger ears to help with air conditioning to cool its blood, whereas the Arctic hare has shorter ears and they get around differently because they're running from different predators and live in different environments. This is what you call microevolution. This is the only thing that Darwin ever observed. Nobody has ever observed macroevolution where it is vertical between species. You don't ever see anywhere an alligator turning into a bird. All we observe, so they say, well, that's because it takes millions of years for it to happen. So they, they escape it by saying, well, that's because it took millions and millions of years. And if it seems less likely, they just add more millions. But there's problems with that theory, too. You see similarities among species. They said, well, obviously we evolved because look at the things we've got in common with monkeys and different animals. And the reason you have things in common is because we all live in the same environment. And I just put some uh, automobiles on the screen as an illustration. You got a Ford pickup truck and you got a Maserati sports car and you got a Yamaha motorcycle. And you know what? You would think, well, maybe they evolved. They've got rubber tires. 
They got a lighting system. They got a cooling system. They got an engine. They run on gas. Uh, obviously, one evolved from the other. Well, no, they didn't. The reason they have those things in common because they operate in a common environment with common methods. They've got common features. One came from Japan, one came from Italy, and one came from the United States. At least it used to. And that's, they got some things in common. So there are similarities that you'll find in different creatures because we live in the same environment. And yet there's also great diversity in the animal kingdom. And you know what, friends? You've heard of the missing link? The missing link is still missing. They found 40 Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons. They have not found one that is a transitionary species. They have found 50 Triceratops skeletons. They're easier to find because they got the big heads. They've not found one that's transitional between it and any other dinosaur. They found about five Brontosauruses. And they found hundreds of other different kinds of dinosaurs, but they're all distinct. They have nothing that goes between them. And they say, well, haven't they found the missing link for man? You look at the picture there on the cover of Time Magazine, and it shows what you think is a skull. Notice they filled in a lot of it with clay. That's because they're optimistic that they found the missing link. You've maybe heard of a Lucy found in Ethiopia in 1949. They say this was the missing link. Here is all of Lucy. That is every part of Lucy. And they're sure that they know that that's your ancestor. How do we know that monkeys were not evolving up <laughs> instead of us coming from monkeys? I don't think I said that right. I guess I was saying, how do they know that it wasn't just a different kind of monkey? It's not a human. And so to build, but you know, you'll find hundreds of monkey skeletons and orangutan skeletons and gorilla skeletons and human skeletons, but they don't find the missing link. It's optimistic thinking. Then you've got the category of what we would call living fossils. For years, they had these um, fossils of what they call a coelacanth. And they have these stubby fins, and they said, yeah, yeah, these are proto-legs. They were developing legs. They, they probably walked out of the water by the shore, and they started walking on land, and eventually it turned into legs. They had this whole theory about the coelacanths, and they said they first came out 360 million years ago. But the problem is that uh, then they found a living one. There's quite a few, actually, that are alive. And those poor things still have the stubby fins and they haven't learned to walk. Indeed, they live in very deep water. You've got the horseshoe crab. Now, I remember seeing these very creepy animals that you see on the right there. They're in New England. You can see the horseshoe crabs. They all come forward, and they are like aliens. There you've got a fossil of one on the left. They're identical, 445 million years old. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a horseshoe crab, and after a million years, I saw all my friends evolving and getting better, and nothing was happening to me. 20 million years go by, and my friends, they go from fish to squirrels. I'd say, wait, what about me? How come? They say, you're ugly. You can't change. <laughs> I mean, why would it not evolve? They, they talk about the primitive eyes. It still has primitive, primitive eyes 445 million years later. Unchanged. Problem is the dating method. Here you've got dragonflies. 250 million years. The only thing is they're smaller now. They were bigger back then and ostensibly faster. Haven't changed. And there's, I could talk about turtles and alligators and megalodons. <laughs> yes, and now let's talk about the dating dilemma. I save this to last because all the whole evolutionary teaching is based upon flawed information about dating. How do we date these things? That's how you come up with the dates. It's all based upon an assumption. They are assuming that they can look at how things are in the world today and place that back in time and say, we're assuming that it was the same back then. And based on that, this is how things would be dated. Well, that's a mistake. They say that, for instance, a Tyrannosaurus rex 65 million years ago, Mary Schweitzer, paleontologist, not a creationist, in dissecting the uh, thigh bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex, found soft tissue, pliable tissue, blood cells, kind of turned the world upside down. They said, oh, it's bad science. Well, then they found other dinosaurs that have the same thing. The bigger dinosaurs with the bigger bones, after 65 million years, still soft? 
let me explain uh, an illustration. So I have you walk into a room and there's a candle burning. That's all that's in there is on a pedestal. There's a candle burning. And I say, I want you to go in there and I want you to tell me how long that candle's been burning. Well, what do you need to know? Several things. How tall was the candle when it started? Was it the whole candle made of the same material? You say, well, I'm measuring how fast it's burning now, but how do you know when you open the door you did not change the level of oxygen it started burning quicker or slower? There are so many things you don't know to get that calculation. They're basing their calculations on the assumption the world long ago was the same as it is today, and the Bible says it wasn't. And they're getting these crazy dates, and <clears throat> oh, I wish I had more time to tell you. I've got quotes from the encyclopedia that explain the, the dating methods, carbon-14 and the isotope dating and the radiocarbon dating, that they're extremely flawed and they get different readings on the same bone sent to different labs. It, the one thing you can be sure of is they're not sure when it comes to dating. And once the dating method falls apart, the whole evolutionary, evolutionary house of cards implodes. The bristlecone pine, I think it's interesting, the oldest trees in the world date back to the time of the flood about 4,300 years, 4,500 years. Some may have actually survived. By the way, that's in California, as are the redwoods. Then they say, what about the ice cores? Yeah, yeah, the ice cores in Greenland and in the Antarctic, and they, they dug them up and they said, yeah, you know, one yard of this, 10,000 years. You hear me? That's a yard of this, 10,000. Each one of these lines represents a year. Well, actually, they found out each one of those lines more like represents a storm. And in one year, you can have multiple storms. And the layers can change. Here's some proof of that. I don't know how many of you read about the Glacier Girl. 1942, six P-38 airplanes were being transported to Europe during the war. They got lost in a storm. The pilots safely landed. Some of the planes were roughed up. The pilots were rescued, but they had to leave the planes because the war was on. Eventually, they got covered by snow. Fast forward 50 years, an American millionaire and an a uh, pilot wanted to see if he could find one of these pristine P-38s had never been flown. Spent years, I think 10 years and millions of dollars, they located them, they finally dug them up. They were 250 feet down in 50 years. You've heard of Falcon Scott who died on his way to the South Pole? They said his grave now is 75 feet down. So the dates they're giving for these Arctic, for these uh, ice cores and things, uh, some of it is pretty fantastic. You know, a person convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Some people go into these things, they've got their mind made up what they want to believe because if they believe there's a God, that means they need to answer to God and it is a religion. It takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. It's a religion to say there is no God I must answer to, I'm going to do my own thing. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you believe it, friends? People say, well, I believe the Bible, but I'm not so sure about Noah and the flood and Adam and Eve, and that part was sort of, you know, their, their stories or allegories to teach us lessons. And, but I believe in Jesus. You can't have it both ways. It's all or none. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Who wrote Genesis? Moses did. If you don't believe in Moses, Jesus said, you don't get to believe in me. Jesus is endorsing the writings of Moses as truth. Now, I know there's some things that may be difficult to understand, but I think it takes a lot more faith to believe that all that you see around you happened by accident or for no reason. It came from nowhere out of nothing. And that means, how do you know that I even exist? I might just be a figment of your imagination. We have no idea about what reality is outside of God. And how pathetic to think that we are just all a big biological accident and there is no purpose to life. I'm so thankful for the Bible truth that creation is real. Because creation is real, it means that God can speak and things come into existence by the word of the Lord. You know, I think it's interesting that scientists have come up with something called string theory, and they say that all creation comes from 
the vibration of sound. I said, you mean like someone speaking? God said? I mean, God, when he speaks, I guess it would make things vibrate. Here you've got mankind in the dark probing around to see if he can figure out where he came from. Friends, it is so important for us to understand this cornerstone of creation because once we understand that we were made by a loving, intelligent God and we understand there's a destiny, eternal destiny, that gives us purpose. This life is about deciding how we want to spend our destiny and how we want to serve God. And what is God's purpose or plan? Is there a plan? And once we understand the battle between good and evil, this cosmic conflict, it changes everything. I am so thankful for what the Bible says in the beginning God created because the gospel is about God speaking his word and recreating us. We must all be born again. And if he can recreate us, he can make us new creatures and he can give us new hearts. Old things are passed away, all things are made new. If God can make a day holy, he can make us holy. The Bible says he brought the world into existence by speaking and he did it in six literal 24-hour days. He didn't need six epics of thousands or millions of years to do it. You underestimate the power of God. I don't understand theistic evolutionists who think we're going to help God out because I don't know how he could do it in six days. So we're going to say, yes, you did it, but it took you millions of years. You don't believe in the miraculous, that God can speak these things into existence. The Bible is very clear. There were six literal 24-hour days. You have to torture the text to make it say anything else. And the good news then is if he can recreate the world or if he can recreate us, he can recreate the world. That means you can have a new heart now and be living in a new heavens and a new earth when Jesus comes. Isn't that good news, friends? Amen. How many of you would like to say, I want to put my hands, put my life in the hands of the God who created me and believe that he can recreate us. And I look forward to that, uh, that world that's coming soon. Let me pray with you before we close this part of our presentation. Our loving Father, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. We're so happy for the reminder that your word is true, that it is reasonable, that it is logical, and of course it's biblical, that you spoke and it stood fast. The whole world came into existence at your word. We're thankful for the truth that that word has not lost its power, that as we look into your word by faith, you can recreate us, and it is very real. Lord, make us into new creatures. Transform us into the image of your Son. We pray that all that happens here today, that you will be present, that you will bless. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
everyone, and we want to welcome you once again to the uh, Granite Bay Church. And we're going to invite you to stand in just a moment to sing our call to worship. You'll see the words on the screen. But when you are standing, we are asking if you could kind of, if you have any open seats in the middle rows, if you can kind of move together. We still have people who are coming looking for seats, so we would appreciate that. Let's stand this time, and we'll sing We Have This Hope. You'll see the words on the screen. We know it's going to be soon. The signs around us indicate in every way that the glorious return of our Lord is imminent. And yet, we have a great task that you have entrusted into our hands to share with the world the pillars of truth emanating from your holy word. So, Lord, as we focus today on holding the line, on lifting up the Word of God, help us to truly see Jesus in everything that we do and to help others to be drawn to the foot of the cross. Lord, thank you for this special weekend here at Granite Bay. Less amazing facts and its incredible outreach to the world and to this community. And now, Lord, we bow before you, our heads bowed, as we worship you and as you help us to hold the line and to share your word in this age which is fast crumbling. We thank you for hearing us in this prayer and bless us in this worship service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
It's okay. Were you blessed by that beautiful music? Yeah. Amen. We want to thank all of those for the many hours of hard work and an orchestra to put this all together. This is indeed a blessing. We do have some announcements that we need to bring to your attention. Today is a high Sabbath. It's part of our Holding the Line series. And so, as you know, we are meeting this morning, but there will be lunch provided for everyone that is here. I don't have to go far. It's all provided. And then at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we will continue our series uh, with a number of outstanding presentations. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. At uh, 2 o'clock, I believe we had Clifford Goldstein that will be sharing the gospel and the judgment. And then at 3 o'clock, we'll have Reese Rafferty. And she'll be talking about, and she's got an intriguing title. Here's her title. The whole thing, a comprehensive, holistic, innovative, evidence-based, cutting-edge health message. So that sounds exciting. We want to see what that's about. And then at 4 o'clock, we're going to be taking your Bible questions, questions related to the foundational pillars of our faith. It's going to be a discussion panel. So if you would like to uh, put one of the questions out there, I'm going to ask media. I think they're going to put up a QR code on the screen. We'll see if this works. And if they can get that slide up with the QR code, I saw it there for a second. If you pull out your cameras right now, take a picture of that. If you take a picture of that, you just click on your camera and you can post your question. You can also see all of the other questions that other people have posted and you can rate the question. And the one that gets the most votes moves to the top of the list. Now again, that doesn't mean we necessarily will do that question, but at least you can vote for the question. So, you can do that, and that's going to be at 4 o'clock this evening. We're going to have the panel discussion. And of course, Pastor Doug, we've got a very special guest speaker that is going to be sharing with us this morning. Amen. And we're just so thankful that the uh, Wilsons are with us today. Uh, Pastor Ted Wilson is the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And um, originally, he and his wife Nancy were joining us, or going to join us for our grand opening. And then there were some COVID issues and that was postponed. And because their schedule is reserved sometimes years in advance, they were not able to come for the rescheduled date. But Pastor Wilson said, Doug, first opening, I will come. I want to be with you. And, and he is a man of his word. And we're just very thankful that they're here with us this morning for this event. Uh, Elder Wilson has been uh, originally ordained as a pastor in 1974 there in greater New York. I was in the cave back then. <laughs> Next year will be his 50th year in ministry. He served as a pastor, president of a publishing house, directed health ministries, stewardship ministries, church administrators in multiple countries around the world. In the last 13 years, he served as a president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists with a membership of about 22 million members around the world. I'm thinking that he and Nancy have been to about 75% of the countries in the world. Traveling around, it's sometimes a grueling job. Uh, you might be interested to know that he speaks French. He can get by in Russian. Dobry Suboda. A lot of our Russian and Ukrainian members will be happy to hear that. Uh, I think he understands a few words of Arabic and he manages to hold his own in English as well. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, he and Nancy are some of the most uh, sincere, dedicated, humble Christians that we know. Karen and I are honored to have them as our friends. I could say a lot more. He's got an impressive resume, but I want to reserve as much time as possible for his presentation this morning. I wonder if you might just join me from the Hilltop Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church in giving a hearty amen and telling him that you're thankful that he's here today with his family. Amen. amen. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Dad. For those of you who are joining us online, we need to tell you about our free offer today. It's a magazine called America in Prophecy. It's one of the more popular sharing magazines that Amazing Facts has. If you'd like to receive a digital copy of the magazine, just text the word magazine to the number 40544 and you'll be able to download a digital copy. Or if you're watching this outside of North America, just visit the afsummit.org website and you'll be able to download a copy and for those of you who are here in person don't leave without getting your free copy of american prophecy read it and then share it with somebody else you will be blessed at this time we will have our scripture reading
Please stand for the reading of God's word. I will be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And it reads, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Amen. You may be seated.
I'd like to invite all of those who can to kneel down to pray with us now. If you can't, you can stand up for us to ask the Lord his presence. Dear Lord God, we come before you this morning praising you first and foremost for being just who you are. Lord, in you we know that life is guaranteed. In you, victory is guaranteed. In you, the good news of the gospel, salvation is guaranteed. Lord, down here, we fight to hold a line. But in you, that line is guaranteed. Father, we do come before you as fallen beings, frail, weak, fallible. But Lord, we thank you because in Jesus Christ we have forgiveness and we have the hope of salvation, also guaranteed. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, for this moment where we can come together, we can sing praises to your name, hear beautiful song and worship to you, Lord, and participate in that, knowing that in heaven, although our song, as beautiful as it, as it may be to us here, it falls short in comparison to the songs of angels. And yet, you listen to us. You accept our worship and our praise. You accept our song. You accept our love and our manifestation of gratitude, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for being the great God that you are, and at the same time, humble and meek, coming down to us and listening to our small words and prayers. Thank you for this beautiful moment, Lord. I ask you to bless the hearts of those who are here right now, each one who is coming from their own situation, their own moment, Lord, their own experiences from the day to day that sometimes just carry us down and drag us down. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here, that in the capacity of worshipers assemble as your children. And Father, as different as we may be, with as many different backgrounds and languages and life experiences as we may have, we all come as one to the foot of the cross. And so this day, Lord, as we hear presentations and we hear so many different perspectives about who you are and how we can also hold the line in our daily lives, I ask you to give us a hope, an open heart. Make us sensible, Lord, and sensitive to your touch, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the truth that penetrates all darkness. And allow us to leave this place later on, Lord, knowing that while we fight and battle to hold the line, our great general, Michael the Archangel, trails ahead of us. Heal those who need healing, Father. Protect those who, needs, who need protection. Comfort those who need comforting. And endow us with your spirit. Imbue us with your blessings. And allow us to hold the line at work, at school, at home. Give us that grace. Give this church that grace. And I ask these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen and amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a great privilege to be here in Granite Bay and to all of those of you here in this magnificent church and auditorium and to those of you watching through television, through live streaming, what a privilege to be together. It's a real privilege to bring you greetings from your worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. Over 20 two million brothers and sisters around this globe. What an amazing family we belong to. And what a privilege to be at the headquarters of Amazing Facts, one of our premier evangelistic organizations that is doing so much to bring the three angels' messages to the world. And I know that the Lord is going to bless our time together as we focus on being faithful and obedient to God's precious holy word. As we hold the line, but not only focus on holding the line, but proclaiming the truth. You see, the wonderful fundamental beliefs that we have 
are found in the Word of God and are augmented by the vital instructions in the spirit of prophecy. And with this beautiful foundation in God's Word and the spirit of prophecy, we are to proclaim Christ's love and his three angels' messages found in Revelation 14. Our wonderful adult Bible study guides are sharing with us those magnificent uh, messages. In fact, it's a great privilege to have uh, Cliff Goldstein, who is the editor of our adult Bible study guides, with us here this weekend. Mark Finley, of course, is the author contributing author to our Sabbath school lessons on the three angels' messages, which are to be proclaimed with power as we rapidly approach Jesus' second coming. I want to specifically thank Amazing Facts and you here at Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church for the vital role that you are playing in touching the entire world with the Advent message. This precious supporting ministry, Amazing Facts, is global in its reach. And I want to thank Pastor Batchelor, a longtime friend, for the amazing work that he, Pastor Ross, and the entire team are engaged in, in presenting these amazing messages through every format possible in helping to prepare people for the soon coming of the Lord. And I want to thank you for the amazing uh, full truth message that you are proclaiming from the throne room of heaven itself. And those messages were given to us in the Holy Word. And that is what is our commission as Seventh-day Adventists in these very last days. God is truly wanting all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we allow him to use us in a powerful way. Uh, Last evening, it was uh, a privilege for Nancy, my dear wife, she's here with us today, uh, for us to be with Weimar University. And wonderful opportunity of seeing how God is using that institution as they combine <clears throat> excuse me, the gospel message with comprehensive health ministry, medical missionary work in reaching the world to help people see that Jesus in his ministry helped people physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. A composite message. I praise God for these two wonderful supporting ministries that are helping not only this region, but the entire globe. You see, God wants us to be part of a message that holds the word of God passionately, holding the line, but then proclaiming the truth. In fact, I'm very impressed with the banners that have been created just for this weekend, the amazing messages from Scripture to stand, having girded your waist with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, and again from the 14th verse, that beautiful aspect of having this righteousness of Christ, which is the core of the three angels' messages. What a privilege for us to be able to share this message in a most powerful way. As we look at the living word and help ourselves to understand that it means we all must be involved in total member involvement, everyone doing something for Jesus, we need to remember that all of this is based upon the pillars of faith that God has given to us, and that's what this entire weekend is all about. Holding the line with the pillars of faith. Those pillars which God has given to his church, his Seventh-day Adventist church, his remnant people from the beginning of the establishment of this precious Advent movement. 
You know, in Scripture it says in Isaiah 40 and verse 8, a familiar text to all of you, but I want this to be a foundation for the presentation that I will be making this morning on the two aspects of those pillars, two of them, the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, and it rings true in 2023 like never before. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. That's what this weekend is all about. That is what God is asking you to participate in and be a vital participant in the proclamation of this last day message. Now today I'm going to focus on these two most important truths, the authority of the Word of God and His instructions in the spirit of prophecy. This afternoon, other pillars will be given. I was very blessed by Pastor Batchelor's presentation this morning on creation. I hope you were as well. If you didn't see it, you better download it and, and see it. Some marvelous aspects, practical aspects about why creation is so not only biblical, but absolutely true and logical. But as we focus upon the Word of God now and the precious gift to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the spirit of prophecy, I want to thank you for your obedience to God's precepts, His truths, His promises, and the prophecies which are so vital to our last day message. Pastor Goldstein will be providing amazing information this afternoon about the sanctuary and about how all of that works into our prophetic understanding. Now let's first focus on the Bible. As we face the last days of Earth's history, and believe me, I believe with all my heart as Nancy and I travel the world and we're back to it because COVID has diminished greatly, we see everywhere the world is falling apart. Now you may be able to come here without restriction today, praise God for religious liberty that we still have. You may think life looks re relatively normal, but you'd go just under the surface and things are fraying everywhere. So as we stand for God's truth, as we face the last days of Earth's history, we must be passionate about the Word of God, the authenticity of the Word of God. In the past, the Bible was held in respect in many places, but now in many quarters it's ignored and derided. We are facing the battle of the Bible. Each of us must stand as sentinels of truth, pointing people to the pure word of God as the source of truth for these perilous times. Again, these banners that have been prepared, especially for this weekend, help us to realize we are to stand for God's wonderful truth. The devil has always hated God's word and does everything to neutralize its effect. It is our sacred responsibility, brothers and sisters, to protect, uplift, and promote the life-saving power of God's holy word. Do not allow anyone to turn your Bible upside down so that in their attempts to make it say what they think it should say, you will be confused. The Bible is to be read as it reads, we are told in the spirit of prophecy. We'll get into that in a moment. So the world is literally falling apart and people are distraught about their personal safety, about what's going to happen in the future. The unknown has become the enemy. Life has become uncertain and unclear for people. Everyone caught up in this cataclysmic destruction. They need to hear the message of hope that Seventh-day Adventists can bear to them. 
and the healing that can come in the reading of the Word of God. People don't think the world is headed in the right direction, and I will tell you, they are right. We're living in the end of time, and according to Seventh-day Adventist prophetic interpretation and the correct hermeneutical application of Scripture, we know we are living in the last days of Earth's history. But what is needed is not a political, a military, or a social solution, but it is a passionate return to a biblical foundation, God's holy and sure word. As Peter faced his own death, he shared tremendous encouragement about certainty in God found in 2 Peter chapter 1, 15 to 21. And thank you for the beautiful reading of the two passages this morning. And I want to stop and just say what a marvelous choir and orchestra Granite Bay has. Thank you for your music ministry here, which lifts us to the throne room of heaven. Second Peter chapter 1, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. God always wants us to have a clear vision of the big picture and the assurance of our salvation through Christ's life, his death, his current ministry as our high priest and his grace provided to each of us. Uh, verse 16, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses for his majesty. You see, in this age of uncertainty, God's word is true and faithful. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now Peter affirms the word through an audible and a visual personal account. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there is no better testimony and witness than you, that you can give than a personal testimony of your connection with heaven. Make sure you're taking time, unrushed time. I have to confess for a moment here that I have become, as many people have, tremendously connected with this iPhone. The iPhone provides us with all kinds of information, tells you what, tells you what the weather's gonna be, the time, wakes you up, tells you connections with everyone, emails, text messages, all kinds of stuff. And I have actually, when I wake up, the first thing I do is fall on my knees, talk with the Lord, ask for wisdom, for the Holy Spirit, for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit upon this earth. But then I would go to my iPhone as I was, you know, making preparations. And then after looking at all kinds of things, then I would finally take a little time in the Word of God. I want to tell you in the last few days, because we have an initiative now at the General Conference that is being proclaimed all over the world and let it be known today, uh, you'll hear about it, back to the altar, drawing especially young people, but all of us back to personal connection in worship to our God every day. And I have made a commitment. In fact, my wife has been after me for a while on this because she's noticed that, you know, you're, you just jump to that phone. I do not look at anything until I look at the word of God. And I urge you to do the same. And the same thing at the very end of the day. Let the word of God be on your mind, not what's on world news. So as Peter confirms this visual personal account, uh, it is to be our own affirmation in our own heart. Verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, or as another Bible version says, a more sure word of prophecy. 
Peter goes on to say, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So the sure word of God has always been a shining light in a dark place, especially today in 2023. The Bible, God's holy book, his holy word is authoritative. It is our handbook for living, not just something to put next to your bed or on a living room table. It is for you to devour, to, to focus on, to understand, and to truly live by. It's far more than a collection of recommendations or interesting commentaries. It is God's sure word and has heavenly authority. Be passionate about God's word. Peter goes on to say in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, this is really important, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is where the authority comes from, not from humanistic interpretations, but from God's direct contact with his prophets. People have always needed a firm foundation to count on, and it is needed today more than ever, and will be the only source of comfort and of hope for the future since it points to the everlasting gospel message indicated in the first angel's message of Revelation 14. The word of God points to Christ his righteousness, his salvation, his ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And yes, brothers and sisters, there is a sanctuary in heaven. There is a holy and most holy place. And Jesus is in the most holy place right now, interceding for you and for me. The Bible provides the only hope for a future. It is our enormous privilege to passionately share it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what a privilege to hear the instructions of the Word of God, to understand the directives that God gives to us for living a victorious life through Christ, justifying and sanctifying righteousness and power. Christ's righteousness, as I said, is the core of the three angels' messages. However, the Word of God is being ignored more and more. In fact, it's fashionable to misinterpret and misapply what is plainly indicated in the Scriptures themselves. It is being reinterpreted by those who participate in higher criticism or the historical critical method uh, approach to scripture as opposed to the historical biblical or historical grammatical approach which Seventh-day Adventists have used for decades which is line upon line precept upon precept verse upon verse let the Bible interpret itself through the power of the Holy Spirit you see it is not God's plan that human beings will then take upon themselves to become the arbiters, the deciders of what is truth and what is error in the Bible. Everything in the Word of God is absolutely accurate and true. He wants us to faithfully follow and promote the right way of interpreting Scripture. Unfortunately, there are those who in certain cultural and societal trends today who would have us understand that biblical passages such as the first chapter of Romans would not be the actual words of Paul but actually Paul was in some way recording what people were sharing at that time, and Paul was in some way making fun of what was being said because actually what is written in Romans 1 about human sexuality is really not accurate. It's just some form of understanding at that time, and we don't have to follow it. 
Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, don't allow anyone to misinterpret what is plainly written in this word. Stand on the word, hold the line, and proclaim the full truth as it is in Jesus. Pastor Batchelor already mentioned this morning in the area of marriage. It is a marriage between and he had to explain it, one biologically originating male with a one female. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, let us treat all people with respect, with Christian love, but let us point them back to Scripture, which tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature, Old things are passed away, all things become new. That is the conversion experience. And that is what all of us can experience as we look at the Word of God. Stand passionately for God's Holy Word. Listen to the following instructions about accepting the Bible as it reads in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 171. God requires more of his followers than many realize. If we would not build our hopes of heaven upon a false foundation, we must accept the Bible as it reads and believe that the Lord means what he says. As we face these last days of earth's history, we know there will be a determined effort by Satan himself to destroy and neutralize the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. It's Satan's plan to undermine God's plain, thus saith the Lord. We see determined efforts by individuals motivated by Satan to attack the spirit of prophecy and make it of none effect. The word of God and the spirit of prophecy are both products of heavenly inspiration. Now we do not place the spirit of prophecy as an equal with the Bible or over the Bible. This is our rule of faith. You can find all truth in this word. But the spirit of prophecy has been given as a wonderful, augmenting and illustrative uh, way in which for us to fully understand what God wants us to do at the very end of time. Both of these the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, are accurate accounts describing the great controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. This is why the devil is so determined to destroy the truth found in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But the devil will not succeed. However, in this process, if they're not careful, Many people will be deceived. God has given us a mandate from heaven to be defenders of God's word. As this whole theme this weekend, stand firmly, hold the line. He's calling each of us as Seventh-day Adventists in this remnant church for a unique last day purpose and mission as participants with him in proclaiming the three angels' message of messages of Revelation 14, and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, calling people back to the true worship of God. This church was initiated by God himself at the right time, in the right place, and for the right reason to fulfill Revelation 12, 17, a church and a people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now let's spend a few moments focusing on that second pillar, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. How reassuring to know that God's prophetic word has been confirmed over and over throughout history and that it continues to be God's prophetic word. How encouraging to know that prophecy, whether in the Bible, or in the spirit of prophecy, did not come by the will of an individual, but was inspired 
by God to individuals as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we're here today, here in Granite Bay, being broadcast worldwide to confirm this vital truth as we head into the final days of Earth's history. Today, let us personally, whether you're here in the audience, whether you are watching online, wherever you might be, let us renew our commitment to the understanding that we are a prophetic movement with a prophetic message on a prophetic mission. We praise God for this precious biblical message that points us to the soon coming of Christ. And as you observe world events, we immediately recognize that Daniel chapter 2, Matthew 24, Revelation 13 are rapidly being fulfilled. No one can solve the insurmountable problems facing society today. Every week we can see the horrible results of unrest, killing, violence, natural disasters, and treachery. I want to urge you to pray for the few members that we have in the country of Sudan. We are working with uh, our setting there and uh, we have some missionaries in Sudan. Pray for the few members that we do have in that country, but pray especially that somehow God will use this to amplify his work in that very large country. Also pray for our dear members in Ukraine and in Russia and in Eastern Europe. Our hearts are broken because of what is happening. I'll just tell you, in Ukraine, we lost about 8,500 members when the war began. They scattered into different places all around the world. But God has replaced those 8,000 people in the churches, and our churches on Sabbath in Ukraine are packed. You can't find a seat. Pray for our people in that precious region. We better understand Luke 21, 26, when it recounts men's hearts are failing them for, from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Signs of uncertainty are all around us. Social trends continue to defy biblical truth and heavenly principles. Economic instability is ever present. Ecumenical trends are pointing to the fulfillment of Revelation 13, verse 3, which says that all the world wondered after the beast. Let me just stop for a moment and tell you I believe completely in what John the Revelator explained in Revelation 13 and onward. I believe every word in the wonderful book, The Great Controversy, and let no one ever dissuade you from that beautiful understanding of the final events that are unfolding before us. We're to remember that in this confusing age, why God has brought a clear prophetic calling to his church throughout the ages in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, a light to shine in a dark place. And again, let me thank Amazing Facts for what they are doing in such a dynamic way to bring light into a dark place. This prophetic emphasis points people to Christ, to his holy word, to his church, to his prophetic movement, to his biblical plan for the family, to his sanctuary message, to public and personal witnessing for him, to belief in and use of the spirit of prophecy, to the proclamation of the three angels' messages, to Christian stewardship, to living a healthy Christian life to Christian humanitarian service, and to sharing the promise of Christ's soon coming. A complete picture. God wants us to have the full confidence that we must have in his holy word and his absolute power. This is why he provides direct prophetic intervention in our lives through biblical prophecy and the spirit of prophecy in the form of Ellen White's writings. We are to place ourselves in God's hands, joining millions around the world in this remnant church to proclaim the soon coming of Christ. This is the beginning of a mighty movement that God will finish through the falling of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. And I urge you to pray that God will prepare every heart, your own heart, my heart, 
for the reception of the falling of the latter rain. Explain to your loved ones, your neighbors, your friends, what Jesus has done in your life and what he can do in their lives to become changed people through his blood and the power of the Holy Spirit. Tell them of Christ's righteousness, his justifying power to cover our sins with his robe of righteousness. What a beautiful passage in Revelation 3 that tells us about what we need, including that robe of righteousness. And his sanctifying power to help us to grow on a daily basis to become more and more like him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever believe anyone that says, well, just, you know, believe in Jesus and don't worry about anything else. The Lord wants us, not that we are saved through our works, he wants us to understand how he can help us to be victorious in our lives through his power, not our own, and how we can become more and more like him. Tell your loved ones, your neighbors, your friends of the prophetic guidance in the life of his church and in your life. We're to believe in God's prophets and share that God reveals his secrets to them. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe Ellen G. White as a servant of the Lord and a prophet. This church would not be where it is without God's special counsel given through Ellen White. This is precisely why the devil is so intent on destroying the spirit of prophecy that points us back to the holy word of God. In Selected Messages, book 2, page 78, we read the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the spirit of God. Satan will work ingenuously to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. He will bring in spurious visions to mislead and will mingle the false with the true. Let me just stop there for a minute. That's why you have to know your Bible. That's why you have to be reading the spirit of prophecy. Don't just depend on Pastor Batchelor or Wilson or anybody else. You need to be sure of what you understand because people will try to mix truth with error and so disgust people that they will regard everything that bears the name of visions as a species of fanaticism but honest souls by contrasting false and true will be enabled to distinguish between them another quote selected messages book 1 page 41 gives us another warning Soon every possible effort will be made to discount and pervert the truth of the testimonies of God's Spirit. We must have in readiness the clear, straight messages, those pillars, those hold-the-line truths that since 1846 have been coming to God's people. So today, let us here in Granite Bay and all over the world, let us reaffirm the wonderful gift of the spirit of prophecy. As Revelation 19 verse 10 indicates, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Seventh-day Adventists do not portray the spirit of prophecy as part of the Bible or equal to the Bible. The Bible is our rule of faith. However, I fully believe that the spirit of prophecy, personally, I believe this, and I hope you do too, is inspired by the same heavenly inspiration as that of the Bible, since it is the testimony of Jesus. Selected Messages, book one, page 41, tells us, through his Holy Spirit, the voice of God has come to us continually in warning and instruction to confirm the faith of the believers in the spirit of prophecy. Repeatedly the word has come, write the things that I have given you to confirm the faith of my people in the position they have taken. Time and trial have not made void the instruction given, but through years of suffering and self-sacrifice have established the truth of the testimony given. The instruction that was given in the early days of the message is to be held as safe instruction to follow in these closing days. What an amazing quotation that aligns itself with the theme of this weekend. Hold the line. Believe in the pillars God has given to us. And I believe that the spirit of prophecy is one of God's greatest gifts given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
It focuses on Christ, his all-encompassing righteousness, his plan of salvation, his grace and his ministry in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary at this very moment. The spirit of prophecy portrays God's plan for his people living at the end of time. The final events of the great controversy are about to take place and are taking place. The spirit of prophecy is as relevant today as it was when it was written. Let me tell you, Nancy, my dear wife, is an avid reader of the scripture and the spirit of prophecy, and she has remarked to me several times, after reading something from the spirit, Spirit of prophecy, that's like an email Ellen White just sent us today. It's accurate and up to date. You see, it points to Christ and to the Holy Word. It's truly the testimony of Jesus as outlined in Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 19, 10. The spirit of prophecy was given to nurture God's last day movement with instruction from heaven and guide in the establishment of a remnant people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And let's not say that with any self-pride. We're all sinners at the foot of the cross, but God has given to us an amazing opportunity and so many wonderful resources. Believe it, use it, proclaim it. You see, he's using the spirit of prophecy to prosper his last-day church with about 22 million brothers and sisters around the world. And one of the greatest threats to following God's counsel in the spirit of prophecy is not necessarily animosity against it, but rather indifference. People are unacquainted with it, or they just ignore it. I'd like to urge each of you, just read it. See what it'll do in your life. Testimonies, Volume 4, pages 390 to 391, we read. <clears throat> the volumes of the Spirit of Prophecy, the forerunner of the Conflict of the Ages series, and also the testimonies should be introduced into every Sabbath-keeping family. And the brethren should know their value and be urged to read them. They should be in the library of every family and read again and again. You should <clears throat> excuse me, lend Spirit of Prophecy to your neighbors and prevail upon them to buy copies for themselves. The Adventist Home, page 479, indicates that the Conflict of the Ages series should be placed in every family in the land. Now, you can, you can get everything right on here now, or iPad, or whatever. Read it. Look at it. The Spirit of Prophecy has been instrumental in establishing so many of God's institutional activities for His church, publishing, health, education, the spirit of prophecy has guided the pastoral, evangelistic, missionary, and administrative expansion of the church as well as almost every aspect of life, including theology, lifestyle, personal health, the family, the home, young people, interpersonal relationships, personal stewardship, editorial activity, education, health care, and many other subjects. The spirit of prophecy continues to guide, God, guide God's people and will until the Lord returns. Satan attacks it, the spirit of prophecy, because it contains God's important counsel for the last day remnant church. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 48. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of churches in them for this reason. Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. Now I have a very personal reason to believe in the spirit of prophecy. About 1870, William immigrated to the United States from Ireland. He was of Scottish and Presbyterian background. He and his wife, Isabella, also from Ireland, lived for some time in Philadelphia where he worked as an engineer building locomotive engines. He finally headed out west to the Big Tree area of Northern California to do logging. He settled down in the area north of Healdsburg 
not that far from here, becoming a fruit and cattle rancher and running a country store. He was a good person, but not necessarily a highly religious person at that time. Eventually, William and Isabella had four sons. Isabella became a Seventh-day Adventist through the witness of dedicated church members in that area, but William did not. In 1905, some tents were erected north of the Russian River near Healdsburg for a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting. Isabella invited her husband, William, to come to the camp meeting, and he accepted. As William was sitting under the tent, the speaker began to unfold the wonderful truth about Jesus, sharing the need for all sinners to have a Savior and allowing him, Jesus, to change their lives. At the end of the sermon, the speaker made an earnest appeal. And much to the surprise of Isabella and others, William stood up and went to the front, giving his heart to the Lord. He studied this precious Adventist message for about a year. He closed his store on Sabbath, trusted God for the future. He was baptized and joined this precious remnant church. He later became the head elder of the Healdsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Christ changed his life, and he became known as a generous man, helping many people in need. William and Isabella Wilson were my great-grandparents. And the speaker, who preached so earnestly about Jesus at that camp meeting, and the conversion experience that, take, that took place at that camp meeting. The speaker was Ellen G. White. She had purchased property in Healdsburg after James White died. My grandfather, wonderful grandfather and grandmother, deceased now, as my parents are. But I want to tell you, soon we will see them because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. My grandfather remembered Ellen White coming to their ranch home when he was a boy and how she lovingly told stories to him and his brothers as they sat at her feet. The Wilson family owes its knowledge of this precious Seventh-day Adventist message to the direct, practical, prophetic, and evangelistic activities of Ellen G. White. What a marvelous blessing we have in the spirit of prophecy. It is our sacred responsibility to nurture the belief in and active use of the spirit of prophecy. Don't give up or get discouraged by anyone deriding or mocking your belief in the inspiration of the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. It is not the time for apologies or uncertainty about God's special prophetic people and his Advent movement. Don't be afraid to let people know who you are and who you represent, our eternal and all-powerful God in heaven. And when people ask you who you are, look at them straight in the eye and say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist and let me tell you about it. Today, here at Granite Bay, Let's commit ourselves to following God's instruction in his holy word and his spirit of prophecy, to daily walking with him in Bible study and prayer as we allow him to work in us in revival and reformation and our special emphasis on back to the altar, personal worship with God. The dilemmas of this world tell us we are at the edge of eternity. Take this call from God very personally and seriously as we expand the vital outreach of mission to the cities, comprehensive health ministry, massive publication outreach like distributing the great controversy to millions of people during 2023 and next year, and evangelistic outreach by the church and wonderful organizations that do that like Amazing Facts. Become involved in the daily mission of the church through total member involvement. Everyone doing something for Jesus. Let pastors and lay members, young and old, work 
with organizations like Amazing Facts and other church entities to help win souls for the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is counting on every one of you. Evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. All of us are to be involved in it, either through personal witnessing, small group evangelism, or public evangelism in its various forms. Adapt your methods and reach out. He will bless every outreach effort that you provide all to his glory. The devil knows that if he can get God's people to look to themselves and their own opinions instead of looking to Christ, that he will be able to bring in dissension, disunity, and tension. Be passionate about total member involvement and look only to Christ. God has called us to be participants in the greatest proclamation of truth in history the culmination of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Whatever you face, do not be tempted to work independently and apart from the church. Stay unified with your local church and conference and other entities and with God's worldwide church family. Stay close to the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. Seventh-day Adventists have been known as people of the book. However, in this age of relativism, existentialism with no absolutes, are we still known as people of the book? As church members with a sacred passion for God, lift up the word of God and make us champions of the word, people of the book. I urge you again, to take part in daily Bible study and reading of the spirit of prophecy and earnest prayer. Some time ago, I passed a church sign not far from our home which said, dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. In our busy routines of life, have our Bibles become dusty? Acts 17, verses 10 and 11 talk about the sacred passion of the Bereans for the word of God. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Many of the Jewish Thessalonians were jealous of Paul and Silas's popularity with the people and they were not willing to dig deeply into the word and be transformed. Instead, they joined a rebellious group and succeeded in putting the city of Thessalonica into an uproar. To avoid further violence, the believers sent Paul and Silas during the night to Berea. There they found open-minded and kind Jews who were willing to listen and then dig in to the scriptures to prove what they heard was truth or not. Acts of the Apostles, Apostles, pages uh, 231 to 232 indicate, daily they searched the inspired records and as they compared scripture with scripture, heavenly angels were beside them, enlightening their minds and impressing their hearts. I want to tell you right here in Granite Bay today, Heavenly angels are by our sides, opening our minds as we prayerfully study the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. The Bible points us to Christ, the living word who brings conviction and conversion. The spirit of prophecy points us to the Bible and the living word, Jesus Christ. We're living in the Laodicean period when the devil will try everything to distract us from the Bible and from truth. Every possible means will be used, recreation, media, amusements, work, music, disagreements, false teachings, family difficulties, economic problems, health difficulties, even pandemics, anything that will take us away from God's holy word. Another great danger we face in keeping us from digging into the word like the Bereans 
is that we are living in an age of experiential religion. People claim that you must feel the Spirit. Emphasis is placed more on feeling like the Thessalonians promoted than on searching the scriptures as the Bereans did. We read in the book, Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 89, and this is an amazing quote. In the last days, the earth will be almost destitute of true faith. Upon the merest pretense, the word of God will be considered unreliable while human reasoning will be received though it be in opposition to plain scripture facts. That's the age we're living in right now. Don't be fooled. Feelings lie. But truth is based on the authority of scripture. Now there are physical and mental benefits from studying the Bible as opposed to spending time on trivial things. Councils on Sabbath school work, pages 22 to 23, read, Thousands are today in the insane asylum whose minds became unbalanced by, reading, by novel reading, which results in lovesick sentimentalism. The Bible is the book of books. It will give you life and health. It is a soother of the nerves and imparts solidity of mind and firm principle. My late father-in-law, a wonderful physician, Dr. Donald Vollmer had a patient. His name was Phil Collins, an attorney, a retired attorney. In his retirement, Mr. Collins asked my father-in-law what he could do to prevent mental deterioration. My father-in-law told him that the best way to keep his mind sharp was to read the Bible. Uncle Phil, as he became known to the Vollmer family, did just that and read himself into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He became a close family friend and a faithful church member with his mind staying alert past 90 years of age. The word of God is like a hidden treasure that keeps blessing the believer who digs deeply. Matthew 13, 44, Christ shared the parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 104, we read, in the parable, the field containing the treasure represents the Holy Scriptures, and the gospel is the treasure. On page 100, it reads, the Scriptures are the greatest agency in the transformation of character. If studied and obeyed, the Word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. On page 107, the Bible is God's great lesson book. His great educator, the foundation of all true science, is contained in the Bible. And above all else, it contains the science of all sciences, the science of salvation. The Bible is the mine of the unsearchable riches of Christ. On page 111, you can check all of these yourself, either online or if you have the hard copy. It says, our salvation depends on a knowledge of the truth contained in the scriptures. It is God's will that we should possess this. Search, oh search the precious Bible with hungry hearts. I want to stop and just say, is my heart hungry for the truth is yours. Arthur Maxwell, now deceased, but one of our uh, great writers in the Adventist church produced many things, including the Bible story account, uh, bedtime stories and all of that, recounted the story of a rich farmer in ancient Greece who on his deathbed said to his sons, my treasure is buried in my fields. If you want to be rich, dig for it. After the father's death, his two sons thought their father had hidden his money in a treasure chest somewhere on his farm and went to find it. They dug with great enthusiasm, but seemingly without success. They turned over the soil in every one of the farm's fields, digging to a depth that no plow had ever reached, but with no sign of the treasure chest. When spring came, the search ended so the fields could be planted with corn. Summer came, and what a harvest they had. In digging the land so thoroughly, the sons had achieved the riches they had been looking for. 
their wise father's unusual plan to help his sons value the land had succeeded. We've inherited a precious fortune. It is buried not in a field, but in the Bible. As the Brians did, we need to passionately search the Bible, digging into it with all the spiritual tools we have to find real treasure. The Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy bring us face to face with the greatest treasure, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. The Bible reveals that salvation is only possible through complete reliance on Christ, His life and death, His resurrection, and His current ministry for us in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. It tells us that the Sabbath is God's special seal and covenant with His commandment-keeping people. It confirms our belief in a hope of a soon, literal, second coming of Christ. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy help us know that we serve a God who never fails and whose church will be triumphant against the attacks of the devil regarding false doctrine. The word of God and the spirit of prophecy stand sure, hold the line, stand for God's truth. In second book of selected messages, Pages 392 and 394, we read, we are living in the perils of the last days. A superficial faith results in a superficial experience. All should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves individually. There is great need to search the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and learn the text thoroughly. Apostasies have occurred and the Lord has permitted matters of this nature to develop in the past in order to show how easily his people will be misled when they depend upon the words of men instead of searching the scriptures for themselves, as did the noble Bereans to see if these things are so. Only in following the lead of the Bereans will we be able to stand the test since the Bible is the only foundation to build on. Satan will do everything to destroy the confidence of you and me as Seventh-day Adventists in the landmark biblical truths and pillars we have held dear. But the devil will not succeed. It is recounted in historical literature that in the year 360, Flavius Claudius Julianus, or Julian, ascended the throne as Caesar. He was the nephew of Constantine the Great who, quotes, Christianized the Roman world. Julian sought to reestablish pagan worship and was known as Julian the Apostate. He openly persecuted Christians whom he called Galileans and withdrew the legal protection granted them by Constantine. Interestingly, he had been educated in Athens by a committed Christian with the name of Agathon. Although Julian persecuted Christians, he invited his friend Agathon to serve in his court. Julian frequently teased his Christian friend. On one day, in front of a large group of wealthy Romans, Julian asked, Agathon, how is your carpenter of Nazareth? Is he finding work? These days, Agaton smiled and answered, he is perhaps taking time away from building mansions for the faithful to build a coffin for your empire. <laughs> Less than two years later, on June 26, 363, Julian lay dying with a Persian arrow in his chest. He had led his troops attempting to take the ancient Persian Empire. Julian grasped a handful of dust red with his own blood, throwing the dirt in the air. He uttered in Latin his last words, desisti Galilei, meaning you have conquered. Galilean, the Roman Empire crumbled, but the eternal empire of Jesus lives on and will culminate with his glorious second coming. 
The Lord wants his church to be the champions of truth through his power. As Selected Messages, book 2, page 396 indicates, the church, enfeebled and defective though it be, is the only object on earth on which Christ bestows his supreme regard. We are to lift up the banner of Christ and proclaim the distinctive biblical and prophetic messages he has given to us. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 384. We are Seventh-day Adventists, and of this name we are never to be ashamed. As a people, we must take a firm stand for truth and righteousness. We must look ever to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. By God's grace, let us champion the Word of God and lift up Christ, who is the living Word. Let us make the Bible come alive and make it the foundation of our belief. God's word changes lives. Let's value and use and promote the precious instructions in the spirit of prophecy. My fellow believers, the Bible in your hands, whether it is hard copy or electronic, holds God's messages for you and for all this earth. It is your one true foundation and sure word as we face the uncertainty of the future. Jesus is coming soon. In fact, the devil will attempt to counterfeit that climactic event. You will not be able to believe even what you see, except that you verify it by the word of God. Today, <clears throat> here in Granite Bay and wherever you may be watching, I challenge you to be passionate Bereans, to read the scriptures daily, to know the word, to read the spirit of prophecy, to cherish, believe, and share these eternal words and instructions from God. Allow the Bible to live in your life and the instructions in the spirit of prophecy to guide your pathway. As Paul says in Colossians 3.16, I have to tell you, I, I'm reading Colossians, I, Moved on to the next book, but I said, no, I've got to go back to Colossians. And I'm rereading Colossians. It's a short book, but fantastic book. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As we see the end of time approaching, let's be involved in all that God intends for his remnant church. Total member involvement. Every member lifting up and sharing Christ, his word, his righteousness, his sanctuary service, his saving power in the great controversy, his three angels' messages, his health message, his last day mission to the world, and his soon second coming. <clears throat> Say to the Lord, yes, Lord, I will go. I will be part of your last day proclamation of the Advent message. Use me in any way you can to hasten your soon second coming. God's unique mission for the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a prophetic work guided by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God and by the Spirit of prophecy. We are nearing that glorious day of Christ's return. He is calling for each of us to stand for Him in commitment and service as we proclaim this precious Advent message and fulfill Revelation 12, 17 through His power. Soon... The work will be finished and the proclamation of the three angels' messages will be accomplished. One of these days, very, very soon, we will look up into the sky and see that small dark cloud approaching about half the size of a man's hand. It will get larger and larger and brighter and brighter, filling the entire sky, millions of angels making up that marvelous cloud with a brilliant rainbow above and lightning underneath and right in the middle of that incredible cloud will be the one we have waited for, the one who is altogether lovely, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords and will look up and say, this is the God that we have waited for. He will save us. And Christ will look down and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We will rise to meet him in the air, following those who have died in him, who will be resurrected and taken 
into heaven. What a wonderful time that will be. The difficulties of life will disappear. God wants to guide us here at Granite Bay and wherever you may be. Guide us through the Holy Spirit, through his word, and through his spirit of prophecy as we truly head into the last days of Earth's history. I want to ask you, as part of God's called people, who keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, will you join me in daily walking with Christ, spending time in his word, engaging in the power of prayer, and being enriched by daily reading the spirit of prophecy? Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes and by his power and grace, be waiting to see him coming in the clouds of heaven? If so, would you just join me in standing right now? Amen. <clears throat> I want to ask one more question. And that is, will you accept the challenge of re reaching your community, your neighbors, your friends? your business associates with a pre precious prophetic Advent message through personal and through public outreach activities such as Amazing Facts. If you want to say, yes, Lord, I want to be part of it. I want to be on the forefront of sharing these precious messages because I know Jesus personally and I want him to use me in a powerful way. If you wish to have the Lord work through you in this year of 2023, in bringing at least one soul to Jesus, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? Amen. Father in heaven, you've seen the hands, you see people standing. We are here committing ourselves to the amazing, inspired word of God and the inspired writings in the spirit of prophecy and to a relationship with you every day in deep and profound prayer. And then to say, yes, Lord, I will be part of it and I want to share this with others. Lord, use us in a marvelous way as we come to the very end of time. And as we continue to focus today on holding the line, on uplifting the pillars of faith, and understanding your pure word of truth, help us to be personally reaffirmed in our conviction that your church and that you hold absolute truth and that we want to be part of it. Thank you now, Lord, for hearing us. I place all those standing wherever they are, here in Granite Bay and elsewhere, in your hands. Use us in these last days of Earth's history. And please, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn.
Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your ever-present understanding of how to lead us through your word, through the spirit of prophecy, and through the Holy Spirit guiding each of us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And Lord, we ask that you will fulfill in us the following blessings. May the Ten Commandments be above you to shield you. May the Beatitudes be within you to ennoble you. May the golden rule be beside you to guide you. May the three angels be before you to focus you. May the spirit of prophecy be behind you to enlighten you. May the righteousness of Christ wrap around you to secure you. May the Holy Spirit be upon you to empower you. And underneath you, may there ever be the everlasting arms. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank you for joining us here for this uh, very special worship service this morning. I want to thank those who are joining us online. I want to remind you that we will start again at 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Clifford Goldstein will be talking about the gospel and the judgment, so you don't want to miss that. God bless. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.